and starting. But welcome this morning. I'm Beth up here in Escambia County, and I'm going to serve as your moderator. So if you have a question about something Stephen's presenting, please put that in the chat box. And if you can limit that chat to questions, that way I can keep up with it and we'll ask him at the end. So now let's meet our speaker. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Stephen for about 25 years when I was down in uh, Collier County a long time ago in the 90s. Uh, but Stephen started his career in Jamaica as an extension agent and also has a great deal of experience as a farm advisor out in Los Angeles. So he's been all over uh, before we were fortunate enough to have him come to Florida to work as the agriculture agent in Lee County. That's how we first met. He was still in ag. Uh, and then he moved to the wonderful field of horticulture uh, to, to help a lot of the residents down there in both the ornamental uh, side and the edible side. Uh, Stephen's passion is really palms, tropical flowering plants, native plants, and of course you'll see him a lot on videos solving a lot of landscape problems. Uh, so I'm excited to see the presentation as well as you, and we are really looking forward to hearing about Stephen's top flowering shrubs and vines for Florida. So with that, Stephen, we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, nice being uh, reacquainted with you, even if it's not live. So we're going to talk about top flowering shrubs and vine. Obviously, I'm going to leave a lot out because you can't capture everything in such a short presentation. And also remember, I am basically uh, a South Florida agent but I've been throughout the state traveling in central and northern Florida. So hopefully I've captured some of those flowering shrubs and vines in those areas. So the first thing we're going to start with is, let's see here, uh, an introduction. And what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about angiosperms because all of the plants we're going to see today are angiosperms. We'll hit hardiness zone so you'll know what zones are and where you're located and others are located. We'll do an introduction to shrubs, um, introduce shrubs that is, then native shrubs, then introduce vines, those are the exotic vines, and then we'll uh, conclude everything with native vines. So the plant kingdom consists of fi five uh, kingdoms, including gynosperms. Gynosperms have no flowers, and they basically bear seeds and cones. So we're not into that today. We're into the uh, we're into the angiosperms. The angiosperms are the flowering plants. They have fruits or or seeds in the ovary. Um, in our case, we're going to look at the dicots. Remember, they're also monocots, consistent primarily of palm grasses, lilies, etc. But we're looking at uh, the 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 ones that for the most part, not all cases, have um, beautiful flowers such as bohelias, oleanders, and lantanas. So here is Florida hardiness zone, and we go from 10B, the warmest. By the way, the key, I believe, is 11A to 8A, all the way up in the panhandle. So 10B is 35 minimum average winter temperature if you get that low because sometimes we don't even get that low 30 degrees centigrade for 10a let's go up to 9b we have 25 and 9a we have 20 degrees fahrenheit let's skip over to 8b that's 25 degrees uh, on average minimum winter temperature if you get that cold and up there i presume you do and then 8A is 10 degrees Fahrenheit, so that's a huge difference. And by the way, um, from west to east coast in my area, along the same longitude, um, I checked the temperature today in Fort Lauderdale and Fort Myers, and at about 6 a.m. there was a 10 degrees difference. So even us on the west coast are a little bit chillier than on the east coast at the same longitude. So let's start with introduced shrubs. And the first one we have is the butterfly shrub, Bodelija davidii. It originated in Northwest China 
and Japan. So that's kind of a cool area. So cool that it can goes down to zone, hardness zone five, which is temperature of approximately minus 20 degrees. Now, in, in doing this, let's remember that even though that plant can grow in zone nine, it may not, it, it probably freezes out every year. So in many cases, it would be growing as a quick annual in the very coldest of climate. In the warm enough climate, it will have an extended period. So this plant blooms from May to October for about 68 weeks. It's, and it's really not that hardy as far as temperature south of Lake Okeechobee. We have some here in Lee County, but they would probably be better off somewhere else. So in order to keep this particular one young and healthy and to keep uh, flowering, remember the flowers eventually they bloom out. What you can do in this case to extend the bloom is make sure that you deadhead them. This way you'll get second and third flushes and in a lot of these, when you deadhead things, remember, invariably, the flowers or the blooms become smaller. The butterfly bush, and by the way, as I go through these things, I'm going to give you a morphology um, a lesson as well, telling you about the shape, leaf arrangement, and type of flowers, inflorescence, if there are any. So butterfly bush, opposite, you can see that clearly. The leaf shape is what we call lancelet. It's kind of tomentose. In other words, nice soft hair that gives us this nice color iteration right there. The flowers, um, they're clustered densely. You can see that they're in what we call panicles and they're up to eight inches long. So when you walk around and see this, it's massive, massive. And uh, the, here, here are some flowers right here. This is a panicle, it's cone shape and um, distinguishing between panicles and cyme and racemes, that's another lesson. So that's the first plant. And, you know, going back to this right here, this picture, believe it or not, was taken about, and I didn't give him credit for this, this particular one, was taken about two weeks ago in Ohio. So a friend of mine, uh, uh, extension agent emeritus, Doug Claudwell, sent me this picture from Ohio to the second plant. This is plumbago. Now, several years ago, not many years ago, plumbago was having a horrendous problem. There was an insect called chilithrips that was devastating this, so much so that it became, it was once a big favorite and really not so much anymore. But I've noticed in the last three to four years, this plant is having a comeback. It's a woody evergreen, more or less. It's kind of a vine shrub and it uh, has an irregular growth. Native from South Africa, and it will go as low as 25 degrees, meaning zone or hardness zone 8B. And it flowers a lot, almost continuously throughout the year. Here are two um, examples that you can see, and I'm sure these are, are singular plants, and look at that spread. It's uh, that one on the left uh, can't be a foundation plant anymore. It's really blocking everything, but it's a beautiful site. The one that is tumbling over the fence is trying to be a vine at the same time shrub. And if there were a tree there, it will probably begin to grow up the tree. And um, again, this requires full sun for the best flowers. This is an excellent plant. It can be a ground cover as well. You can use it on embankments. I've seen this as hedges. You can grow them three to four feet easily. And of course, they grow in planter boxes and they will just spill over in these block boxes. It's an excellent flowers. No chili thrips, of course, if no chili thrips. Leaves, they're alternate, they're simple. And if you take a close look at the leaf, it almost looks as if they're whirl. But in this world, there are some leaves that are so tightly packed, they alternate on the stem or substem, and they look as if they're whirl. But believe it or not, you take a good look, these are still alternate leaves. It's something like the plumeria, if you're familiar with it. Here are the flowers, they're funnel form. We'll see an example in a minute. 
um, that, uh, that is the corolla is funneled from. There are five lobes and they go about 1.5 inches across. So here it is. You can see the funnel form. And again, the plumbago, blue plumbago in this case. There is also a white cultivar. This is an excellent um, ground cover. And in South Florida, it almost always blooming, except maybe for a couple of months out of the year in the, during the coldest time. All right, our next candidate, our next flower, flowering plant is Mexican sunflower. Now there are two types, but the one that we're looking at, this is an annual plant. This uh, picture here is of a single plant I took actually last week, and the owner of this property told me that it is four months old. So this originated in Mexico to Central America, and we call the habit coarse because the leaves are so big, they're not tightly compact, but it is non-clumping and it is somewhat gantly. In other words, it's kind of just wander uh, all over the place, but it goes to zone two to 11. And, and again, this is an annual, so you, know, you can grow tomatoes in zone two, you can grow tomatoes in Canada, so treat it the same way. So this is zone two to 11, and it blooms primarily from July to October. Same yard, there it is right there in another location. And the owner tell me that these two plants are seven months old. And you can see they've become a little scraggly, and there is a lot of reseeding going on. So what he tells me is that um, he allows these plants to seed, he deadhead them sometimes, and by March of each year, they just come up. He has nothing to do with it. They just volunteer. So the Mexican sunflower has alternate leaf. They can be entire, meaning um, uh, essentially simple, or they may have three lobes, as in this case. You can see those lobes here. And for the most part, the plants with three lobes tend to be the younger plants, the four months old plant. And as they age, they begin to develop these single leaf um, to, hit, to show alternate single leaf. Here is the flower. It's orange to orange red, and the rays are surrounded by orange yellow discs. So this then are the discs right here. These are these, uh, the rays right here. And don't forget, the rays are male, flowers, so each petals that you see here is an individual floret, and it is packed, the center or the disc is packed with the male florets. This then is a composite flower, and it is in, in and of itself an inflorescence. And this was at another location with the, the, the same species, the Mexican sunflower, and in about 20 minutes I were there, I took pictures of all of these visitors. So this one is a great pollinator plant. And we have a golf literary. We have an adult of the same species. We have skippers. We have white peacocks. I was looking for monarch, you know, but I guess monarch probably don't populate this very much because of the type of plant it is. But we also have um, bees as well, many of whom were native bees. And again, this is one of the best wildlife flowers or plants that I've seen. Really a superb one. So this is the Mexican sunflower. Now there's another plant that we also call the Mexican sunflower, and this is this one. Now I don't want you to plant this one. It's not the same thing. IFAS assessment tells us that this has high invasive risk. So this is diversifolia which is not the same as what we just saw. Let's go on to something a little bit um, different here. This is chestnut leaf elder, Tacoma castanifolia. Originated in really the warm tropic, Ecuador and Peru. It's a large evergreen shrub. It can be a small tree. This one here is about 14 feet tall and they can go up to about 20 feet. It blooms mainly spring and fall, and this picture was taken in the fall. 
Actually, the best blooming period with the Tacoma um, castanifolia and the Tacoma stance, which is a, another species, tends to be in the fall. They're absolutely fabulous during that time. So the leaf from this one, it's, they're opposite. You can see that they're clearly opposite. Let's take a look. See that right there? Opposite. Um, simple in most cases, and you can see how simple it is, just one blade, that's what it means. But we also have trifoliate uh, leaves. So there's one right here popping up, and the trifoliates are in the min uh, minority. And we have a leaflet here, a leaflet here, and the, the apex leaf is the largest of them all. But the edge, or the margin as we call it, we call these toothed right there so this is the toothed margin and you know when you buy plant and you choose plant as master gardeners the people take thing into to you for id this is what you want to look at is it is is it simple is it try what kind of compound if any leaf it is um are, are the margin cunate are they uh serrated or dentated and the, keep an eye out for this this will help you in your plant id so we also have here the flowers, they're in terminal racine. So actually what we're looking at, this bees on one of them, are florets from the inflorescence, which are racemes. They're golden yellow, and in this case, the throats or the center right here, they're not streaked in this case. There is no coloration right there. It's pure yellow. We take a closer look at, or another look at is, and we can see the terminal racine. So if you look right here, this uh, these are opposite leaves, of course, and here is a racine coming out of this end, and a racine right there, you can see the flower stalk, and this is the flower itself, and that's what we call the racine right there. This is one racine, this is another, and then we have more as we go up and as the plant um, uh, grows and ages a little bit. So this is the chestnut leaf elder, pretty good plant, very nice looking. I see actually a lot of it in central Florida. Okay, down here, 9A to 11, um, we have the Chinese perfume tree. However, in many cases, people prune these, and it's not a big tree. So they're easy to prune, and you can keep these as shrubs. I'm beginning to see a little bit more of this, they're evergreen, and I'm going to call them a large bushy shrub or small tree. They get to be about 16 to 20 feet tall. They're dioecious, meaning male and female flowers on separate plants. So um, bloom sporadically throughout the year. Look at these leaves right here, both from the same plant. The bottom leaf or smaller leaf almost looks like the leaf of an orange jasmine. This is a larger leaf right there, but the arrangement is alternate, pinnate. So these are pinnate. This is a pinnate leaf, and partially, I add to this, bipinnate. You can see this right here. This would be bipinnate. And the leaflets are ovate to elliptical leaflets. So here are some more right here. This is typically the leaf that you see at the newer growth. Again, they're alternate and pinnate, and they look a lot like orange jasmine. And here are the flowers. They're on axillary panicles, and they're not overly showy because they tend to sometimes be hidden by the foliage. But once you expose them, once you see them, you're gonna be taken back as we saw in the first picture. Okay, the next plant, let's look at Bohemia. Galpinii, and this one is from southeastern Africa. Now, when we say that, if you think about southeastern Africa, those are dry places. They're like Kenya, Somalia, in, in that area. So they're pretty dry. And I presume since they're in that area, there are probably some of these growing in the Arabian Peninsula over by um, um, Saudi Arabia and those places. I can't imagine that that isn't so. But in any case, southeastern Africa, we're looking at zone 8 through 11, minimum 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, why should you plant this? Well, it blooms primarily in the spring, intermittently in the fall, 
it's easy to keep in shape, is semi-deciduous, and is somewhat scandent. It's somewhat kind of, you know, just want it to go its own way, but it's relatively easy to cut back. It's a gorgeous plant. Um, here's another one right here. And again, semi-deciduous. And this one also is in full bloom. So you kind of have to go a little close to see all these lovely flowers on this red bohemia. The flowers are, the leaves are alternate, simple, and bilobe or notch. They say bilobe because we have two parts, but if you look more closely at these, you see these two lobes are actually just deep notches that separate them. So it's not quite bilobe, and the bohemias, as a rule, are bilobes and much more deeply than the red bohemias. So let's look at the flowers. They're scarlet, brick red to orange, and um, they just keep this, these this appear to be cymes, and they just keep producing and produce over a long period. This is the fruit. It's a flat, compressed pod, and more pictures of the flowers. Again, I believe this is a great plant. Um, if you're willing to prune it back a, a little bit, one of the owners told me that she, it took about three years for it to become established. After that, it began to really grow and flower really well. So this plant too, sometimes it suffers from a lot of um, uh, high pH, a big, uh, deficient nutrient deficiency because it's in high pH, but it doesn't kill it. Give it a little bit of fertilizer. This is an excellent shrub for your area if it's the zone is correct. This one I took up in Central Florida, October 16th. This is a Southeast China origin. It's a fast grower. It can be a large shrub or small trees. I've seen it grow and dung here in my area and it bloom, blooms spring, summer and fall. And it's when you see this, this one doesn't have as many flowers as um, some I've seen. The flowers are so large that they, they, they just, they overpower you. And I believe, if my memory served me right, I was in Honduras many years ago, and I went to a nursery in Honduras, or one of these roadside nursery, and um, I saw this plant, uh, the, the nursery owner was selling this plant. And, and the thing about uh, places like Honduras, they have these elevation in which you can grow plants that are not normally for the tropic, but they still grow there. So as we know, Florida is basically all sea level. So there are parts of Florida that are probably warmer than those parts of the world. But in any case, this is a great flower. Um, the leaves, uh, they're alternate. They're broadly ovate to what we call round ovate or chordate. They're palmate with three to seven lobes. So if we look at this one, this is one lobe. This is a second lobe. I say this leaf has three lobes. This one is struggling to make one, two, three, four, five lobes right there. So um, the margin is obtusely serrated. So see these little thing right here on the margin? That's the margin of the leaf. And they're about seven inches long. So they're big, uh, big leaves. So it's a kind of a rough textured plant. The flower buds are typical of hibiscus. It is a hibiscus. And the flowers open white in the morning. They go to pink then red in the evening, and the color changes, they say, may actually be affected by temperatures. So here is the white in the morning, and it will go to here in the afternoon. Now, one, one thing that I've noticed on this, there, there's a drawback to many plants. And in this particular case, this plant, like many hibiscus, remember it's in the same genus, this particular plant, sometime I've noticed, does develop a uh, bad case of white flies. But if you treat that, do it well, I think this is going to be an excellent con uh, plant. And it's called Confederate Rose because it was grown a lot in years past in states in the South. So then this is Confederate uh, Rose, very nice plant. And I've basically only seen them as doubles. There are probably some singles as well. Here's a great plant, Mexican Bush Sage. This one is from central and eastern Mexico. It's perennial. It's not woody. It's herbaceous. 
it will grow to about four feet. We can take it to zone 11, and I've seen this grown in Gainesville. And my comments are, you can use this for bed, boarded, put them in containers. They make excellent cut flowers. They're somewhat drought tolerant, but they become unsightly if they're too dry for an extended period. So this then is Mexican bush sage. It's a salvia. Here are the leaves. They're opposite. They're grayish green. They're kind of lanceolate to linear, and they're about four inches long. And the flowers, look at this. They're on terminal spikes right there. So essentially new growth or panicles extending above the foliage, as you saw. That's what makes them so spectacular. So you have white tubular corollas, corollas, which are these right here. So this is the actual flowers. And from longer lasting, which are these right here, calyxes right here. So that, that's a beautiful sight to see. Look, look at this right here. Beautiful, that's one plant. And in the, on the right sunlight, this is an excellent plant and it's better in full sun, a little dapple shade it will tolerate it. So this is Mexican bush sage. Then we have right here a Camellia San San Qua, and this is from Japan and islands off um, Japan. Zone 9B, minimum 5 Fahrenheit to 9. So this is, I, I don't see camellias in South Florida. I haven't seen any. They're evergreen shrubs or small three, trees, three to 20 feet tall, and they can have some spread. Now, some cultivar stay low and spread horizontally, and they bloom fall and winter. And here's a close-up of one here. And I'm told they open in succession, as again, I'm saying, I'm not that familiar with ca uh, camellias, except when I go up north. And they'll do that for four to six weeks. The flowers are single. That means they're not compound. They're not in inflorescence. But cultivar flowers also include uh, uh, semi-double or, or doubles. So, the, uh, excuse me, the flower arrangement is, is, is single, but you also have flowers or petals that, they, they, uh, that are single, uh, double or semi-doubles and, um, and doubles themselves. So colors are primarily white, forms to red. So this again is a camellia, nice plant, excellent. I'm always impressed by it. And every time I go, I hope to see these flowering when I'm up there. Let's take a quick look at native shrubs. So this is our second of four categories. And our first is the Christmas berry. And you can see in the specific epithet that is probably grow as far north as the Carolinas and meaning zone 7A to 11. But it also grows in Florida, southeastern United States. It grows in Lee County. As a matter of fact, this picture was in Lee County. It's woody, it's upright, it's an open shrub to about 11 feet tall, maybe a little bit more. And it's somewhat spiny and the branches are drooping. It blooms sporadically on and off all year with the peak blooms being in summer and fall. So if we look at it right here, we see alternate leaves. They're narrow. So this is something actually, uh, this plant grows in a lot of moist areas, wet areas. But we've grown it here at the extension office in dry soil. So it can grow in dry soil. It's a nice little compact plant. I've seen it in a couple of parking lots and you know there's nothing drier than parking lots. So the, the, the plant is somewhat spiny and they have thin grayish bark and it, the, the very bottom where the soil meet the plant, it begins to develop several trunks or stem at the same point. So the leaves are succulent and they're narrow as you can see. So this is more or less the plant without, without the flowers. So let's take a look at the flowers. They're lavender to lilac or rarely white. And I would say they're semi showy if only a few are in bloom. They're very small, three eighths of an inch um, wide. And they, they make a fabulous display once they are 
clustered or when there is a big spat of bloom. This picture was taken 17th of November and it, it, it is a nice plant to see and the stem themselves have lots of flowers all the way along the stem. They're not just clustered at the tip, they're all the way. And here we see the fruits, Christmas berry, the fruits are red and succulent showy berries and they come out in the fall and winter, probably spring too. And let's take a closer look at these berries. They're in my palm and there we see they, they look a lot like these wild peppers that sometimes grow wild if you take a look at them right there. So this is um, Christmas berry. It's a nice plant for wet areas, but it also will grow in drier areas. You don't need much pruning on this plant at all, and it makes a very nice plant, especially in full bloom. You won't forget it, believe me. So, um, what is our next plant? And by the way, this one is obligate wetland species, live to about 50 years, probably outlive most of us at this point, salt tolerant and useful in coastal landscaping. Here we have button bush, origin, Maine to South Florida, west to Texas, even California. Kind of think it probably escaped to California. Large shrub or small tree, it's briefly deciduous. And here you see it's growing in a wet area. It is apt to do, this is its natural inclination. So we go from zone A, minus 30, flower spring, spring to fall. Here we see it growing in a swale and it's been covered up by a lot of other stuff and it is native all over the place. The leaves are opposite, sometimes whirl, meaning uh, three or more at a node. They're entire, they're simple, and somewhat rounded in some cases. And from the same shrub, here I've taken off leaves and you can see what they look like. And those are the immature inflorescence. So these are inflorescent at the very end here. And as they progress, look how beautiful that is. So the corolla are what we call stamenus. And here is one flower one um, inflorescence, creamy white with many yellow tip anthers. And we have these growing in, in many undeveloped parts of South Florida, at least on my coast. So this is a beautiful shrubs. It's always recommended and it attracts a lot of wildlife as well, a lot of pollinators. Oak leaf uh, geranium, this was taken 27th of October in Gainesville. And um, it, it ranges from Florida, Georgia to Louisiana. This picture was taken at the time when it was deciduous. So it's an upright deciduous shrub, typically six feet tall, and it blooms late spring to early summer. So let's see what it looks like when it is blooming, because this is going to blow you away. It is so beautiful. There you go. Same plant. Okay. And I think this is 27th of October, but now let's look, uh, take a close look at the inflorescence. So the leaves are three to seven and the inflorescence is a panicle and it's creamy white and it changes to purple uh, to light brown. And light brown, that means it's just fading away. So this is a beautiful plant. It is oak leaf hydrangea. And I love this plant when I saw it and I've seen uh, several of these growing up in central Florida and beyond. So here's another shot at the uh, panicle. And excellent fall color. It has exfoliating bark. It's good for shady locations. It's easy to grow and blooms occur on old wood and prune if needed immediately after flowering. So don't forget the bloom occurs on the older wood. And this is what you're seeing now. Tea bush or gray leaf is another a native zone 8b um, to 15 degrees habit it's irregularly dense rounded or mounts and is suckering this is an informal and a low input landscape plant and here you see it's growing uh, uh, across the path from wild coffee so this is more or less a native uh, garden scene that you're looking at and a formal setting 
and leaves are alternate. You can see that, right? See the alternation of the leaves. There's one right here. Here's another leaf right here. And they're simple and the margin is as serrated or dentate. You can see that right there. And the flowers, got a flower right here, on new growth on terminal panicle. They're vivid purple to about two inches. So here's a closer look at one of the leaf right there and you can see the dentation right there. And here is a closer look at the flowers and they're held in very small terminal panicles. So that's tea bush or gray leaf. It flowers a lot and I think about four months ago I saw it flower in, in somebody's yard and it was just covered with flowers. This is something you should consider getting. It's a tough plant and I've seen it grown in all kind of condition. So again, it's good to um, zone 8B. So for most of you, consider this, you can grow it. Yeah, okay, here's horse mint. I love this uh, flower. I took this one, uh, this is a, a roadway in St. John's County. This was on August 30th. This is a very nice plant. It grows in Eastern and Central North America, down, down to Palm Beach and Collier counties. So it's clump forming, it's herbaceous, it's an annual, kind of biannual in some cases or short-lived perennial. It is, it, it is a wildflower uh, listed officially, but it's a great shrub. Zone six to nine, anyone can grow this. So this is on an embankment, this is unattended. And in the same county, this is along the Atlantic coast, you can see it stumbling down from the hills. Uh, this is a rare point in Florida where we have um, um, kind of a elevated area. This was probably about 30, 40 feet high, and you can see it kind of stumbling down. Beautiful when you see this in flower. It's really enchanting. This was 30th of August, and it was all over this coastal area right here um, in this particular in St. John's County. And the stems is hairy, they're square. So what's the stem if we go here? That's it, we have, we have four sides to the stem. They're not rounded or triangular. If you have square stem, you're looking at the mint family. If you have triangular stem, you're kind of looking at sedges. In this case, the leaves are opposite. We have one here, we have another here, and we have new stem coming out of the node right here. And I do give a class on identifying leaves and everything else. And I always tell people, if you want to know what a leaf is, look at the node. And if more than two things can grow out of the node, that's where the leaf begins. So it began right here and ended here. And it's a simple leaf and they're land shaped to somewhat oblong. And flowers are spotted with purple and they appear in the upper leaf axils and stem ends in two or more tiered cluster. So let's look at this a little bit closer. There we go. It has whorls of showy pinky, pinkish leafy bracts. So let's let's examine this real quick. Those are the Steve, leaves right here. You have five minutes left. Five minutes, I'm not gonna do it. I'm just gonna rush. Those are the flowers and those are the bracts. So let me go through this really quick. Introduce vines. These are, this is garlic vine. I should have just done this in shrubs or vines. And it is, uh, this shrub is about 30 years old. Um, this is uh, what we call two foliate leaves. And I'm just gonna go through this real quick to let you see what you're missing. This is bleeding heart. This is in early June. And here is a plant growing on a cabbage palm. And this one was taken in Bay County, the one on the right. So despite everything, it can grow that far north bleeding heart right there. You can see the opposite, uh, opposite simple leaves. If you look really close, you can see that they're opposite. And you can see, look at this right here. Isn't that beautiful bleeding heart? Here is uh, evergreen wisteria and southern China. And here it is right here. And we're going to go through it real fast. I just wanted you to see what you're missing. Here is a native uh, wisteria. And you can see the compound alternate odd pinnate leaves. You can see the inflorescence, which are the seams. They're fragrant. And if we go this one, don't plant it, Chinese wisteria. Believe this or not, I took this about 15 years ago in Fort Myers. And queen wreath, 
Can't grow in most places, but look how lovely this is. Kind of look like a wisteria. And look at this, sandpapery leaf. They are simple and opposite. And what we have there are the flowers, kind of blue and the calyx, kind of white. This is yellow butterfly bush. Oh boy, gotta rush it. Yellow flowers are clawed uh, petals, fringe margin you can see, and those are the fruit. And the fruits are what we call sam Samara. They're, and in this case, they're dry and dehiscence. Dehiscence mean they're not opening up naturally. And that's the very bottom picture on the right. I had to break that open. Flame vine, up to 40 feet tall. See the leaves, the leaves here too are trifoliate. And look at this lovely, this is growing on a fence. And look at that on the wall. Look at those in my hand, beautiful. So let's go to Confederate Jasmine on a horizontal trellis and a vertical trellis. And what else can be grown as ground cover? I've seen people grow it as such and they cut it back. You can grow it around mailbox, which is very commonly done. And leaves are opposites. They're salverform flowers, and those are the pod. They look like plumeria pods, oleander pods, um, desert rose pod because they're all related. Sticky white sap, vigorous grower, native vines. Let's do this really quick. Uh, here's one for the uh, warmer areas. We call this one wild alamanda. Here's another shot of it. Clambering or twiny vine, and here are two more pictures. The leaves are opposite, flowers are yellow, trumpet shape. And here is a cross vine. This was taken at Bomb Gulf Coast Research and Education Center in Florida to Virginia. So it is very cold hardy. It's a high climbing, fast growing, semi evergreen woody vine with tendrils as it moves out. You can see the leaves there. They remind you of garlic vine leaves because there are two opposite leaflets and may be trained as a ground cover as well. Look at these, aren't they beautiful? And look at the cross vines right here a little bit closer. And this is a cultivar called Tangerine Beauty. And I'm almost out of time, if not already. This is Carolina yellow vine. Uh, and it does grow well here, sometime a little sparsey opposite glossy dark green leaf. These are solitary flowers, but they're bright yellow and tubular. They're flaring and they can grow, of course, on trellises, ground cover as well, wreath. And this is climbing aster. I only have about three or four more rushing through this. And it grows in a ball. That ball was naturally formed on the right and is climbing up a cabbage palm. You can see alternate entire grayish leaf. And look at this right here. Let me show you what this, oh, look at that. So it is an aster, it's climbing aster, and I've seen it along river banks. This, of course, you're all familiar with the coral honeysuckle that's on the fence. The leaves are opposite, but look at this. Near the where it blooms, the opposite leaves, they fuse together. Really remarkable. And uh, you can see the inflorescence just coming out of there. And the flower color can be a variety, but they're in whorls and terminal spikes. Is there another plant? Yes, I have. I think this could be my last one. And it's not grown really as a, a, as a plant, as an ornamental plant, because it seems to be everywhere. This is morning glory or blue morning glory. And there are many morning glories that are native, but this goes all the way up to zone eight. Flowers just about all year. And the picture on the right, now it says zone eight to 11, and I'm sure Massachusetts, Bradford, is not in zone eight, but it's grown up there as an annual. Someone sent this picture to me, minus 10 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a quick annual. It looks like it's on somebody's wall or fence. The one on the right is uh, Lee County, and that was taken, um, probably it can be taken almost all year round around here. So natural landscape and habitat restoration. These are the leaves, they're alternate long stalk, and here are some nice flowers and you can see in this case, the leaves are not lobed. And if you want to get on our Instagram account in Lee County, it's easy to do. Just, uh, just go to Lee underscore UFIFAS. Any question, Beth? Yes, we do have some questions. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, first of all, uh, I'll ask one for Clara. She asked, is the yellow jessamine unhealthy for honeybees? I 
you know, I don't think so. I believe I've seen honeybees around the one that we have, but this may not actually be. The way this uh, flowers are shaped, they're probably not very well shaped for honeybees, um, just the way they're tubular. So there are probably some other um, pollinators that would be doing this, such as butterflies or maybe even um, hum hummingbirds or something. But I don't know them to be toxic to um, bees. OK, our next question came from Carol. She asked about the plumbago. And is there any cultural way to prevent the extensive galling that occurs on the older woody growth? She's just been cutting it back to the new growth. Yeah, that does happen with that. I, I would like to ask her how much does she water because this plant may be on the dry side a little bit. I've noticed when it's over, they're over water, they develop galls. Um, and galls or two can be caused by insects, but I don't believe these are insect galls. I believe they're more fungal galls. Okay, Carol, if you'll put in the chat if you about your watering, we'll maybe get that. We had a question from Pat about the Christmas berry. Is it edible? And is it safe for pets? Wow, you have to ask me the tough question. I've never eat, eaten one, so um, I should have looked that up. Um, I'm sure they're great for wildlife. Is it safe for pets? I don't know. Because as you know, different animals have different systems. So they may be great for dogs, but hate, hateful for cats and great for birds. But you know what? Uh, I think this information can be easily found because uh, a good site to go to, by the way, is a, is a site called Native for Your Neighborhoods. It's a really great site and it will tell you a lot about the, the minutiae of some of these plants. But I don't think it is um, toxic to animals. So let's, uh, let's not leave it at that. Do your own research. You are, after all, excellent master gardeners. All right, one last question through chat, then we'll ask some of the audience if they want to open their speaker. So what was the name of the plant that looked like Wisteria queens? And queens is it wreath, W-R-E-A-T-H. It's a Mexican, um, Central American plant. It really basically only grows um, in the warmer climate. It probably grows in Sarasota too, that's my guess, but it's, it's a woody plant, very, very beautiful. And it's flower, it, it flowers primarily in May, June, uh, those months. And it looks like wisteria and it's overpowering. Once you see this, you're gonna want it. I think there's a lot of things we want now, Stephen, uh, even up here in North Florida. Is there anyone from our, our friends in the North District or the Northeast District? Would they like to open a mic if they can and ask a question or type one in the chat box for us? You know, someone just answered that they have a great Queens Reese in Zone 9B. So, you know, the... And here's something that um, that's always fascinating to me. You read a horticultural book if you're not in no particular area and it will say zone 10. But in many cases, people can grow them in other zone and they can grow them successfully. So all the plants that I've described here, they're not invasive except for that one wisteria, this Chinese wisteria. So they all can grow and you all know where to go for to look to see if they're any invasive. It's the IFAS assessment of of um, of of. Uh, native plants or something close. So if everyone wants to throw in the chat, what was your favorite shrub or vine Stephen shared? And Stephen, what's your overall favorite flowering shrub or vine? The flame vine. Flame vine. And that was the one with the orange bloom. And it's, I, I think because when you see it, it's just this sudden splash, this burst of color. It doesn't last long. But when you see it, it's really, really, really enthralling and you'll love it. Now, I have other favorites, of course, and there are favorites that I haven't seen yet, um, I'm sure. And my favorites can change from week to week or month to month, depending what season we're in. So right now, I think I'm going to go for Flame Vine and also the Queen the Wreath. I think we'd have people that agree. Some people are throwing out the Confederate Rose you mentioned the Chinese perfume tree, wild alamanda. We love flowering things, of course. Yeah, and um, 
the the wild al alamanda it almost looks like it's 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 not in some ways a florida native it's a great plant it's it's um grown well here and i've seen it around mailbox as you saw i think all, all around posters it grows along fences it's one of the best plant consider it they're all kind of beautiful plants beautiful flowering plants that's one of them yeah some terrific ones any final thoughts or any final questions anyone we have about two more minutes oh so let's see here dutchman's pipe someone loves dutchman's pipe. oh yeah I We've do too. Up here I, as well the I debated if I should include it or not, but I didn't have enough time. The Dutchman pipe, you should see the flowers. It's really big. It attracts a particular butterfly. And actually, it is one, uh, as far as the butterfly species is concerned, a particular butterfly species, you all know more about this than I do. It's a real butterfly attractor plant. And of course, the caterpillars also are on the uh, vine itself. But it's a really, you see this, the the flowers are like big 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 ears big ears and they're lovely flowers and i've seen it grown in central florida too seen it up there yeah Dutchman pie, keep that in mind it's another excellent uh, flower so and vine you've gotten us started stephen and we can't wait to go uh, try some of these plants even up here in the colder areas we know how fortunate you are in south florida to grow so many unique things. But thank you so much for that presentation. And I'm sure everyone is ready to move on and continue with this wonderful sessions. And by yes. the way, you do have my email address and I'm urging you to get on this account, this Instagram account. So everyone just go to your next uh, uh, item on your agenda and click which session you would like when the time comes. Thanks so much. Thank you, Beth. Appreciate it.